Okay. Okay. Let's go. Let's do this. Okay. Uh, sometime back. I think I'm gonna go to. Uh, and you had expressed an interest in redoing this. I guess we can redo it. We can do that. And then we can do like more stuff about something else. Well, I just think the last video I came across as a complete ass. I don't think so. I don't think so. But you're, you're a self-hater, which again, I don't understand that myself. You know, I continue to be a life of a person, but you know, I'm not dating myself. So. <laughs> I, 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 you know, I mean, a self-loathing comedian. I mean, you ever heard of such a thing? Yeah, it's so original. What is this? Is like the same painting they got out there? What is the deal? Oh, the artwork of this place is atrocious. Or maybe, maybe I'm just like, that's where it used to be out there. It's possible. It's a bad illusion to Asian culture. So, how'd you get into comedy? What? Why don't you do a you little, hey, Chris, why don't you do a little intro? Say this is smoking hot and all that stuff. Oh, okay. I, I didn't used to do that. I used to do that like on the credits. Oh. Of the, you know, smoking hot conversations with comedians. My name is Chris Martin, and I'm not fucking really contrary. Uh, <laughs> I don't really let myself go. Uh, this is Blake Midget, a legend among Richmond comedians. But he's moving on to Austin, Texas. Maybe the smartest thing he's done recently. <laughs> Except put his job washing the dog to asshole. Yeah, that, that was, was probably the That thing. was bad. Smart move. That was bad news bears. But I was really disappointed because you didn't get that job as a DJ in the strip club. I think that would have been an endless, endless, endless font of stories. Yeah, and free tits all the time. There you go. And free it would have been amazing. Too. But. I do love a damaged woman. And they are damaged. And I attract them. They're sort of like lint and uh, nice. dryer, yeah. dryers. So we did an interview last year, I would say around March, April, May, June. Mm -hmm. Right up against the wall. Yep. Cafe game. And it was fairly short. And then about two, two or three months later, I said, hey, let's do another one. And we never did it. I saw the interview and I thought I looked like an asshole. I didn't get that impression, but then, you know, I'm an objective outsider and you're a self-loading insider. So. It's true. So we'll do it again, and this time we'll come across as a humanitarian yes. who wants to find... Because I believe... World peace and those... Cure for cancer. Yep. Purification. There you go. So how'd you get into comedy? Ah... Uh, well, um... Bogarts! Bogarts was where People I... People thought you were fun. Yeah, 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 they were like, go, we'll pay for your drinks if you go do comedy. And it's like, yeah, I'll do that, because I don't have a job, and uh, I like to drink, and I just started drinking. Um, I you didn't doing... drink when you were in a punk band? No, no. I, I did drugs every once in a while. Um, I didn't really drink that often. But I got... Like it was all about the music and, and the passion for that and uh, the community that I, that part that thing was in. And I really, just never drank. You I did that for about ten years, right? Uh, six years I was in the band, and it went very well. I made a lot of money. I had a lot of fun. Saw the world. It was awesome. And uh, I don't have any musical talent at all. I just was surrounded myself with people who were infinitely more talented than I was. So, comedy was kind of a thing that's like, well, this is something I can do by myself. I don't have to lean on anybody else. And I turned out to be kind of good at it. Kind of. Yeah, I know. I feel like that's, a dick again. That's that self-loathing thing kicking yeah. in right there. No, I mean, I love it. It's fun. It's a great time. Uh, growing up as a fat kid, I uh, always wanted to be in Sterling, like, Virginia. In Sterling, Virginia. I, I always wanted, you know, you, you as you grow up as a kid, like you want people, you want to be a cool kid, you want people to pay attention to you, you want to influence people, and that just doesn't, it didn't happen for me. So 
I just, I wanted to get out of town. I wanted to be something more than everybody else around me that was good at football or baseball or whatever, because I, I didn't do any of that stuff. So it's just, I had to find another way to do things, and I never, then I saw the way, like Facebook was really good, because it showed me that they all have kids and they're all divorced, and they've been through like a cancer scare or two, and they hate their lives. And I don't, so I, I win. You don't hate your life? No, not at all. My life you just is hate awesome. yourself. Man, I don't really even hate, I don't, I don't really hate myself. Um, there's things about me I'd like to change, like everybody else, I guess, but... Oh, it's sort of uh, just... You're in the smoke room, Chris. You gotta deal with this. Uh, no, I, I like where my life is at, and I like where it's going. And for the first time in a long time, I feel like I'm in the right direction. Great. Right. I like the country. So... Is there anything that you could take from your music and apply to your comedy? Definitely. I mean, you're performing in front of people. Uh, the, the, I learned a lot from the band I was in. Um, Mike and Chris Taylor were the, the, the driving force behind the band that I was in. And they taught me that... What was it, the name of the band? We were called Pink 99. But what I learned from that... We were, we were sitting, we were, when we were doing the interview with uh, Andrew Pollard on Sunday, we were sitting right next to the to one guy from Lamb of God. Yeah. We played our first show with Lamb of God. Except they were called Burn the Priest at that point. It was in Philly at Salad 13. But what I, what I learned from music, um, what I learned from playing in that band is that you know, it doesn't matter if you're good or not, it doesn't matter if it's clean or dirty it's just as long as you have passion for something and as long as you really as long as you care and as long as you are challenging yourself and challenging your audience that's the biggest thing about it and I feel like with comedy I, I, I mean I've learned, I do challenge an audience sometimes I'm not that receptive uh, Charlottesville like a week ago I made a girl cry um, and the funny thing, that wasn't even a reference to anything about sexuality. Oh, it was about AA. No, it was... She said it was about AA, but then afterwards she said that she got molested as a kid. And it's like, I got molested as a kid. It sucks. We move on. That's kind of how you deal with things. But when she started crying, <laughs> it's like, I really touched her. And that, to me, is... Like, I don't... You laugh or you don't, it's fine. It's, but if I make somebody feel something on stage, that's awesome. Because that means that I struck a chord in that person that they don't want to, that they haven't wanted to deal with in a long time. I, you know, I, this is a label and maybe labels are not fair. I call your comedy gonzo, for lack of a better word. When you're dealing with extreme topics, this is something that Silver suggested we discuss. You're talking about and I personally, and, and maybe I'm just weird, but I don't think they're that extreme myself. But you're dealing with what some people would consider to be extreme forms of sexuality. Or whatever. Uh, I mean, you know, to me, I mean, uh, I don't consider fisting to be that weird. I mean, I've never done it myself. What it's like, some of the people do. Maybe it's not something that. Uh, you know, Nancy and Ronald Reagan did, but so what? Well, I mean, I just, I like honesty. Um, there's a lot of things that people don't talk about. There's a lot of things that are taboo. And uh, when I say them, when I talk about things like that on stage, it garners a certain reaction. But I kind of push those buttons on purpose. Um, because I feel like there's no reason to not talk about things. There's no reason to hide behind like, social norms or etiquette or anything like that. I feel like everything is fair game. Well, I think that that, that would probably be the, the, the perspective of a lot of 
understand that. There are no taba taboos. Uh, we've discussed this before. Not we, but but in in, in the podcast earlier. And uh, you know, my perspective is there are things that probably comedians wouldn't deal with like, you know, themselves, but they don't feel like they have the right to tell other comedians you can't talk about this. I mean, the, I mean, the way I, I uh, the way I approach comedy is that it's different from other comics I've talked to. So, I mean, some not so much, but I don't think that like comedy comes from sitting down and writing. I think it comes from going out and living and experience. And I get I do some pretty weird shit, and I think that you get more out of like out of your audience if you talk about things you know about you, I mean there's comics that do jokes about their wife and their kids and people can relate to them yeah exactly or Jeff Kern is a good example he does a twisted take on things but I mean I think Jeff is great with the anti bill product costume I think and more authentic in my opinion. Well, I think I'm very true to Bill Cosby. Like he knew having a family, and he knew having kids, and a wife, and growing up how he grew up. And I mean, I do kind of the same thing. Like I say what I know. Like I talk about the shit that I've done. I don't like to make up things. I don't like to say. So I had a guy that just the other day. Uh, to me, everything I talk about, everything I make jokes about, is something that I've actually done experience gone through like me having chlamydia, me fisting a girl, me doing this or that. These are all things that have happened a little bit. Me, <laughs> me having girls that like, <laughs> Yep. So when you're pressing those buttons are you looking for catharsis with your audience or what are you looking for when you press those buttons? Not I mean, I get the catharsis with myself when I write things and when I when I make when I write bits out and make them happen and say them on stage. That's where the catharsis for me comes. I'm not really worried about my audience like being okay with what I say. I just want a reaction. And most of the time, it's most of the time they're very into things that I say. They they laugh at my bits, and afterwards, people come up to me and they say like, "Oh, you were hilarious," or "Oh, I got this happened," or. I remember the time that I got tested for gonorrhea. It was horrifying, and I'm glad that you made light of it. But I'm just, it, you connect with people on a level that they're not comfortable talking about, but they've been through. And they laugh involuntarily a lot of the time. And that for me is awesome. I think one of the strengths of uh, of your uh, comedies, I think it's very well written, but it is not a criticism, just an observation. I think sometimes the quality of your writing gets overshadowed by the, the topics that you're covering. Yep. It's very well written, but it's like, it's written about some, some what some people would consider to be extreme topics, so that tends to sort of get overshadowed. Yeah. Um, Sometimes, for example, like the girl that cried was like, she cried because I made a, a joke about how horrible child molesting is. And she was very upset about that, that I talked about the whole mouth ripping a toddler thing. She was very upset about it, she started crying. Where does the, where does the skull fucking the toddler come in? Yeah, you mouth raping. You can always use mouth raping. That's yeah. what I tell people. Whenever they do that skull fucking business, I say, hey, I've never heard him say that. He's always said mouth raping. Yeah. I mean, um, people see things like, I try to write things intelligently and I try to write them with a build up and, a, and my opinion on the matter. But when you talk about things like that, a lot of times you have people that they don't hear what you're saying, they just hear what you said. They hear what they want to hear, and then nothing else you say matters. It's like, that's taboo, you're not allowed to talk about that. 
and they don't actually hear what you said on the subject. It's just, that's horrible, you're a dick. And I say, well, you know what? If you'd have listened to it, I mean, most of the time at that point, it's over. And um, for the purposes of the historical record, I'm going to explain that this is a bit in which you talk about reaching rock bottom in AA, you yeah. go to a meeting, and you encounter somebody who discusses not Well, that bit actually came from me going to AA. Um, I, went, I actually got thrown out of the meeting I went to. I went to one and this guy talked about how he drank. Well, it, when it's time for people to share, they talk about the things they've done. And this guy was saying that he drank a lot. And at one point, like, he realized that he was, he was like, I've been drinking for so long. And then saying, I'm molesting my granddaughter. And I'm like, and I called him out. And he sounds like, don't blame that on alcohol. You're a fucking child molester. You molested your granddaughter. And the fact that you're blaming that on alcohol is pathetic. You're just a bad person. The whole punchline from that is like, I drink a lot, but I've never touched a child. That's disgusting. And that's where I was that's where I was going with that bit. And it's the same thing like that AA meeting was like don't blame alcohol for the fact that you're a shitty person. Would you, would you consider yourself an alcoholic? For, no. You're not an alcoholic? Maybe. I don't know. If you, if you ask a doctor, yeah, I am. But I'm not a doctor. I am a doctor. I'm not a doctor either. I, I go on Google for all my medical needs. <laughs> but Doesn't everybody? Yeah. Uh, I, I do drink a lot. And I actually, I, I'm very scared of the fact that like, I don't like to go on stage unless I have a, a buzz going, and that scares me. Was that the case when you played music? No, I was always sober That's when right. I played music. And that was, again, something I was very passionate about. But you don't do, that's one of the interesting things is, you told me at, at uh, Wabi Sabi one time, you don't do drugs. But you don't do Not anymore. those drugs. Some drugs. Alcohol is a drug. Alcohol is technically a drug. I got, I did a lot of drugs when I was very young, and I got it all out of the way, and I don't do them anymore. With a tantric way to. I mean, for me, it's like I grew up in a town where there was nothing happening, and I wanted to experience everything I could. And the only experience there was is like. You go to a football game, you try to meet a, girl, a hot girl, we go to homecoming with so everybody's impressed. For me, it's like, I don't care about that. I want to do acid and figure out things that I don't know about. Did you think acid was helpful? It calmed me down a lot. I used to get in a lot of fights as a kid, and then I did acid and I didn't anymore. It made me a better person. What do you think? Uh, so, is this. Is consumption of alcohol something you want to do about, or you don't care, or when you said you're a little worried about getting a buzz on for you to I mean, I'm worried about like using alcohol as a crutch to be on stage. I perform sober. I mean, you don't you don't seem to have stage fright, so you're not using alcohol to overcome. No, it's just other comics tell me like maybe you should perform sober. I'm like, oh, okay, maybe. And then, I'm like, then I never do, so then I think that maybe I'm... But you remember your lines. It's like, just paranoia. Yeah, I do. You really got to get of course, I, you know, I've, I've heard of instances where, you know, like, one of the Super Friends came out. Yeah. And took a week outside. Yeah, I on you know, a that guy. Was, that was pretty, I think you were pretty much a, not exactly on top of your game. The, I mean... It gets to a point where like you have this sort of like this guy parties a lot and then people buy you shots on the stage and it gets hard to perform when you're too drunk. So that's worrisome, but I mean I manage myself pretty well. Well do you think comedy makes people neurotic or does it attract people who are neurotic and then makes them more neurotic or does it actually serve as a form of therapy? I mean I I, I haven't asked any other comics about it. Um, 
Well, I'm not asking for their opinions. I'm asking for your opinion. My opinion is that I'm just... I grew up as a fat kid and I like the attention. Um, I like people to pay attention to me. I like being in the spotlight. It's something I enjoy and it's something that I crave. It's kind of like, I mean, it's the same thing as like the guy who's a pastor who like people pay attention to him or somebody that starts some silly charity about like, don't you know, run over manatees with a motorboat. Pay attention to me and join my group. Everybody wants attention. Everybody wants them, people to take them seriously. This is just an easy, it's a vehicle for me to do it. Who would you say were your influences or who were comedians that you respect? The influ the, Bill Hicks, my favorite comedian. Um, I, I respect anybody that gets on stage. Um, as long as you're trying something that's new and something that's not safe, I'll respect you for it. Um, I respect you. Thank you. That means something coming from you. I, I just think like getting on stage is hard. And if you have the balls to stand up in front of a group of strangers and, you know, pour your heart out and tell them what you think, and you're, you're up there saying, hey, judge me, laugh at me or not. This is what I believe in, this is what I do. That takes fucking balls. And a lot of people can't do that. And even comedians that aren't funny, that can go up there and just bear their soul. And you know when they're genuine or when they're just kind of like hacky. People that it comes from the heart, I respect that. One of the things that happened after Sticky Rice went away was you started Super Friends Camp. Mm -hmm. And I think that, and of course, obviously, Cafe Diem and some other things that have gone on have sort of helped spark a comedy renaissance or uh, and, uh, maybe taken the scene to another level. So maybe you could share some thoughts on Super Friends Camp. And how many shows did you put on total? I, I don't know. I know. I know you don't. <laughs> you know you don't like the business end of it. You don't like the promotion end of it. You're basically looking for a showcase or a venue that you and your friends could get up and, and uh, you know that you could, could uh, get up and, and just kind of come. When we started the Super Friends Camp thing, it was me and Dave Garland and Camille and Chris. And, yeah. And uh, it just started off because there wasn't that many places to do comedy. There was just Sticky Rice and that folded. And there was nowhere else to perform outside of 955 and the Funny Bone. And I didn't know the Funny Bone people and I didn't know the 955 people. So we wanted stage time. And uh, Camille backed out shortly after we started and then Chris Alford stopped doing comedy. So it just became like me putting on shows. Um, yeah, Camille was going through some life changes. So. Yeah, yeah, she did. And it's sad that kind of what she told me, like other people didn't like her and she didn't like them. And it caused a big divide with me and the other comics in Richmond because I thought like, well, fuck you guys, you don't like her, then you're not good people. And it just kind of became like an us versus them thing, and that sucked. Well, I met Camille through. Uh... Sorry. Gang bang. Cab. Soon. <laughs> met, um, I'll gang bang in the cab in a minute. Yeah, we're, 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 we're getting But uh, I met Camille through. Fuck her. Well, <laughs> probably will. Um, or not. Uh, I met Camille through Planned Parenthood. And, uh, we were talking about it in the park, and she mentioned she did stand up. And then uh, Jerry called around the country to me and said he was looking to do stand up. So I put them together. So that, I would think, helped me to stick to some of the things in writing sessions at Comic Cosmos. My question was going to be uh, what are your thoughts on the Richmond comedy scene? I, I mean, the comedy scene in Richmond is. is 
blown up exponentially. There's shows, a lot more shows than when we started. I mean, when I started, it was just Sticky Rice. And then Super Friends Camp, and Joe Happy did Cafe Diem. And now Odyssey's doing like the two shows. Um, Odyssey Michaels. Yep, Odyssey Michaels. Uh, the Fallout show that John Saucier runs. It's just, it's blown up a lot. There's an audience at almost every show there is. a lot more comics than there used to be, and it's... <laughs> Joe Affie was masturbating outside the window. Uh, <laughs> it just, I, it, so what else is <laughs> Exactly, like, I've seen that guy jerking off inside my window a thousand times. Um, it just, it's blown up. There's a lot more comics, people are passionate about it, there's an audience. And it's a fucking, it's a great thing. Comics that started are all really good now. The stuff that I saw the other time was taking place, and it's I'm I'm extremely impressed. So why do you think it's blown up? It's blown up because people care, and it's it's rare for Richmond because this is a town that doesn't care about anything really. I mean they they. I think that Richmond like wants to be a part of something and they want to be a big town, but I think that you really have to grab people by the by the collar and say, hey, pay attention, Dick. This is important. And we've gotten it to a point where people will care now. They they're starting to understand that comedy can be something that in this town that makes sense and that is important and vital. And they're coming. They're coming out to shows. So why are you moving to Austin? Texas. Because there's no money here. Uh, there's a lot of comedy clubs there, and there's there's an opportunity for success that is not here. Uh, the only real possibility of getting paid for comedy in Richmond is the funny bone, and it's very hard to break into there. They're very family friendly. You've done some shows there. I've done two shows there. They've and you killed. They've both gone over insanely well. But um, I'm personally myself. I'm a riskier comic for them because I drink a lot and because my material is not family friendly. Um, so they'll take somebody who's not as good as me, or as good as somebody, or somebody that's as good as I am. They won't take them, they'll take somebody else who's not as good, but will entertain an audience and sell more appetizers. Well, it's just like Walmart and rock and roll. Exactly. So rock and roll is getting a Walmart, and that's Walmart's choice. So, you know, that's the market they're trying to reach. And it, it's and, um, the nature of the business. Like, there's just, there's not much money to be made in this town because Richmond's a poor town. It's, College kids. So, what do you hope to accomplish when you get to Austin? I want to be ridiculously famous and be able to buy a yacht. <laughs> I want to have a boat and I want to be able to do as much blow as I can. Well, as long as you let Silver and I like uh, swab the decks or oh, something, yeah. that's that's oh. okay with us. We have no problem with that. But, Maybe you could get a little more concrete. Uh, it's, a, it's a bigger city, it's a bigger audience. And I'll be able to touch more people with my horrifying brand of comedy. Literally! Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I mean, I love Richmond, it's a great town. I've had nothing but funnier. I've met How long have you been people. here? Three years mm -hmm. I've lived here. And you moved here sort of as a romantic camp and stance? I uh, moved here because I wanted to go to school and live on the cheap. And comedy was kind of an afterthought, it's just something that just happened, and then I fell in love with it. Okay. Well, that's all I can think of, Dan. Do you have anything more to say? I got nothing, man. Okay, this has been the exit interview. Blake Midget, smoking hot, literally smoking hot. 99 freaking degrees in Richmond today. Yeah. Take two, part deux. And thank you all for everything. It's been a great time, it's been a wild ride, in Richmond I wish you nothing but success.